Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray, Father, that you'd guard our words and thoughts, that what proceeds here will please you, Father, that will accomplish your purpose within the body. We just pray, Father, that the words of our mouth and meditations of our heart will be acceptable in your sight, Father, as we commit this time in ourselves into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. The once and future church, and we're going to explore this incredible tide that we sense of home fellowships. It's really astonishing to me, as I travel, not just the United States, but also abroad, I sense that there are groups meeting in homes all over the world, spontaneously, and some are doing it very constructively, some are doing it very, in very different ways, so we're not here to criticize it or, or to pass judgment, we're trying to understand it and understand its biblical relevance. But before we start, let me ask you a question. Why is the divorce rate among Christians no better than among non-believers. I think uh, there have been so many studies, and the more you study them, the more discouraging it is. You would think that there would be a statistically discernible difference between Christians and non-believers, and you sometimes get the impression that it's worse, if not equal. And we could take many other statistics. You can talk to doctors, have them pull the file drawer open of their unpaid, uncollected invoices, and that'll be their Christian clients. Same thing with Christian attorneys. Somehow, we try to avoid the reality that Christians as a group have a cloudy reputation among non-believers. In fact, Gandhi in India, when asked what did he feel was the biggest obstacle to Christianity in India, his classic reply was, Christians. We watch Christian media Many of us are startled with what we see in some of the television broadcasts. What's going on? And let's ask ourselves another question. What is really meant by the second commandment? Thou, uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What does that really mean? I personally believe it doesn't have anything to do with swearing. That's a whole different issue. Taking the name, the authority, the image, the reputation of God upon yourself in vain, is what that's talking about. If we're his ambassadors, we have an obligation. As we look at ourselves in the mirror, as we look at our friends throughout the body, many times we have to ask ourselves, what's going on? So I'm going to suggest the possibility that there's what I'll call a regeneration gap. Apparently there are over 2,000 churches planted every week, we understand. And from 1974 to 1998, the denomination, the Christian, Christian uh, nominal Christians at least, went from 150 million to 650 million. So it all sounds good as you look at the statistics. But what they don't record is that silent exodus of people slipping out the back doors, almost unnoticed. People who were brought up in Christian homes get married. They try it for a while, but they find it's not that relevant in their lives and they drift away. And uh, they're attracted, but not contained. They're interested, but they're not inserted in a fellowship. They're harvested, but not gathered. They're touched, but not transformed. They looked in briefly, but were disappointed in what they saw. That painfully describes too many, too many people that we run into. In fact, what I'd like to do at this point is pause for a minute, and at the risk of sounding repetitive or self-centered, I think it is appropriate for me to give you a little bit of background on myself. I was raised in Southern California by European parents. My dad was Polish or Austrian. My mother was German. And uh, so as a first-generation American, that means something special, of course. I discovered at an early age I had an aptitude for technology. I was heading, in effect, uh, through a math science major into a, a program with Stanford in electrical engineering when I got an appointment to the Naval Academy. And that did something. The glamour of that attracted me, of course, but it also gave me something that I've never out, outgrown, a passion for adventure. And uh, Naval Academy years were fabulous, and I took my commission in the Air Force, which was a highly desired option in those days. We're talking 1956 graduation, just to calibrate this a little bit. After the Air Force, I was in the Department of Defense in a number of different ways, working for think tanks, for the intelligence community. 
and uh, ultimately uh, into the corporate boardrooms. So uh, I was launched on a 30-year career of corporate development as an engineer turned uh, manager, a businessman. I uh, spent 30 years, um, in effect, buying and selling troubled high technology companies. That was my career path. But along the way, let me back up. When I was a teenager, I developed a deep love for the scripture. And uh, one of my primary hobbies all through that career was Bible study. I just always have loved the Bible. I've collected books on it. Just It, it was probably the principal hobby among my other interests. And I made a key discovery along the way. My personal background or technology background is in the information sciences. And one of the things that I discovered for myself and it become the main pillar of our ministry, is that these 66 books that we call the Bible, even though they're penned by over 40 different guys who didn't even know each other, over a thousand, over 2,000, about 2,000 years, 40 authors, 66 books, over, say, call it almost 2,000 years, it's an integrated message, the discovery that it's designed, that every detail in there is uh, engineered to fit a particular role, and many of the elements anticipate things that happen thousands of years later. So not only is it an integrated design, it has its origin from outside the time domain. That insight grew as my technology background grew and has become a major preoccupation of myself. I think once somebody discovers that for themselves, it gives you an entirely different perspective of the scripture. And I must confess, it gives you a certain impatience with some of the criticisms from the would-be experts that argue, did Moses really write the books of Moses, and so forth. All those arguments betray an ignorance of the depth, the structure, the design of the scripture itself. But in any case, during my executive career, I had an opportunity, in fact, I was requested by the government of Algeria to be their consultant, so I had an opportunity to, to uh, uh, assist them in some computer problems they had. And um, as part of an incentive to come back and elaborate some plans that I had outlined for them, they uh, offered to have my family come along with me. Well, we did that. My, my two sons, my wife and I, had an opportunity in North Africa to spend a, a few weeks helping the Algerian government. What the Algerians didn't know, they, I used the funds from that consulting to extend my travels from there to Israel. And in about 1970, uh, we, our family, just on our own, just showed up <laughs> and went through Israel. Um, and that was our first exposure. I don't think the Algerians knew <laughs> that they were funding such a trip, but that's a whole other story. But uh, when I got back from uh, that trip at our local church, uh, I naturally gave a little uh, trip report of what we'd seen and so forth in Israel, and uh, uh, I gave it a, a prophetic uh, perspective, which startled many of the people that were attending that uh, evening uh, group, because it, it, many people in denominational churches have no concept of the second coming, no real insight into eschatology and the reality of what's going on in Israel, the reality of the times we live uh, hit home. So many of the people there asked, Gee, can we continue this discussion? Because it went on to late hours of the night that weekend. And uh, so we, they all said, uh, Gee, can we come over to your house and talk about this? So that next Monday, I said, sure, come on over. So we had, I think, something like uh, 30 or 40 people show up at our home that Monday and, and just to discuss some of the things that we'd learned in Israel. And that was so vibrant, they asked me at the time, gee, would you take us through uh, The Late Great Planet Earth, which was a popular book at that time by Hal Lindsey, and I indicate, which is something that uh, I was very impressed by and, and I used to point people to. But I said, that, no, I won't do that, but if you want to go through a book of the Bible, we could go through the book of Revelation. How about that? How, how would that be? And they jumped on that. So that started what became the Monday Night Series. We did it in our home for uh, a period of time, and as we outgrew that, we found someone that had larger uh, spaces in their home, and we were in home Bible studies for a couple of years. Before we outgrew that, we finally ended up moving and being invited to, and then moving to the Fellowship Hall at Calvary Chapel. And we taught there for, oh, 25 years, 30 years, something like that, uh, in the Fellowship Hall, and then eventually moved to the main sanctuary. But the point is, these mon our whole background, our whole um, uh, uh, early years in the ministry, were really in the format of a home Bible study. And so um, what was also going on, tapes from those studies got distributed by several ministries, not the least of which was at the Firefighters for Christ. And uh, uh, our whole orientation all along was to put uh, teaching the Word of God above all things. And God has blessed that. And finally, about uh, 11 years ago, 
through the encouragement of Hal Lindsey, um, decided to do this full time, and we have the ministry that you now know as Koinonia House. But I, I, I wanted to recount that for several reasons, because one of the things I don't take for granted is that the, those precious years in those home study groups. I have seen more spiritual growth, not only in myself, but in the other people involved in that kind of a format, than I have in any other kind of endeavor. There's something about a small study group meeting weekly um, by any of the different, a number of different styles. The Lord blesses that. There's an accountability. There's an intimacy. When people pray for each other, they know the names of their kids and so forth. There's a, it's a whole different environment than we generally experience in, in a church that has hundreds of people and many of which we may not know personally and so forth. So there's something going on. So a couple of caveats. We're going to talk about churches. We're going to talk about some of these things with great candor, not to be critical, this is candor without malice. There are obviously many, many fabulous fellowships of all different sizes. There's mega churches that are doing a great job. There's uh, congregations of all different sizes doing all kinds of different things, exciting things. There are some that apparently do draw criticism, at least by uh, people who are looking for something a little different. So we're going to talk about a lot of things, and we're going to try to be candid and open with no intent to offend anyone, or as I sometimes quip, <laughs> we'll try to offend have something for everyone, to offend everyone. But uh, there's something about historical reality. Hegel said it one way. He says, history teaches us that man learns nothing from history. George Santayana said it another way. He said that uh, he that does not know history is doomed to repeat it. And uh, my background is decision theory, uh, information sciences. In, in the mathematical theory of games, you divide all games into two kinds of, of endeavors. And the one that's most often most taught is the what's called a zero-sum game, what one person wins, another person loses. We're not talking about that kind of a thing here. Too often, we tend to see people in churches or groups, um, uh, it's an us-or-them kind of situation. The church is not a zero-sum game, as a mathematician would put it. It's a non-zero-sum game. It's possible for both sides to win. It's a, it's a, in, in mathematical terms, it's a game against nature and, and uh, not against each other. And... Uh, when you get in decision theory, theory of games and stuff, something else you learn after going through all the different styles and models and so forth is that a mixed strategy is always best. And uh, so that leads me uh, to a basic disposition that there are roles for every kind of fellowship. There are roles for the 20, 30,000 people gathering in the stadium. There's a role for the mega churches. There's a role for the modest 50 to 200 kind of local church. There's also a key role for the small groups, and they come up and come in different styles and sizes, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. But uh, one of the things that's really important for these small groups is for them not to become insular, but to network, whether they're networked by being sponsored by a local church, a group of them, or if they just network on their own initiatives, it's essential that they do that. But see, this is the way it all started in the first place. A group of 12 along the seashore started this whole thing with their leader. It's interesting that the birth of the church itself at what we call Pentecost was in a house. In fact, as you study the book of Acts, you discover almost everywhere the churches were actually house churches. You'll find that all through the book of Acts. In the book of Romans, Paul closes his definitive uh, work on doctrine, naming 26 individuals that uh, were in house churches. And all through his epistle, you'll discover, if you read it carefully, he's dealing with house churches, with Philemon and all the rest. You cannot escape the reality that the early church was in homes. Part of that was uh, technology. Part of that was the church was persecuted, first by the Jewish community, and then later by the Roman community. To be a Christian in those days involved jeopardy. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, normally large gathering. And so as a persecuted church, meeting in homes in small groups was the only safe way to meet in the first place. And the church in those days was a theater of miracles. You know, we, 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 we try to look and see what was the fruit. Well, God has sovereignty. He had a sovereignty to make wine out of water, to make donkeys talk, to make water flow from a rock, to part the sea, in fact, on several occasions, to use ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary ends. All through the scripture, God uses all kinds of unlikely candidates to accomplish his work. 
So part of what I think all of us might examine is getting back to basics. You know, the church itself, we're not talking buildings here, we're talking about the secret and powerful society of the redeemed. And uh, it's a place where people can literally see the body of Christ. Not simply be touched by an abbreviated gospel in an evangelistic blitzkrieg of short duration, but to see reality and to see the church at work. What we really are looking for is a return to the New Testament simplicity and authenticity that seems to be so lacking in our culture today. And we're not going to be promoting any particular model. There are all kinds. I was startled at the literally hundreds of books that are written about small groups, home churches, house churches, cell churches, all these related topics. And some of them have some interesting comments, but I think all of them fail to emphasize the reality that there are no rules. There are no models. I think forcing a model is part of the problem. The whole idea in the early church was to let the Spirit lead. And some of the most exciting movements I've seen in my five decades of Christian walk have been where there were no rules. The Spirit moved as He will, and He does. One of the things that I think we're facing as we ponder some of these problems is the biblical illiteracy that's all over the landscape, even among our leadership. It's disturbing to discover how many pastors really don't know their Bible. They go to seminary and learn a lot of interesting things, but the Bible ain't one of them. And uh, often taught by profs who don't take the Bible as seriously as we do. They come away from their training with allegorical myths. With an allegory, can pre you, know, you can almost prove anything. Many of them have no grasp of the centerpiece of Israel and her destiny in the whole biblical plan of redemption. And uh, it's, it's astonishing how some of these non-biblical concepts undergird many, many of our popular denominations. It's disturbing how few pastors and churches are even aware of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Boy, if there's an eschatological doctrine in the Scripture, it's that, to, that it is to expect Jesus Christ's return at any moment. That's all through the Scripture, the imminent return. We may have different views on some of the details, but clearly that's a central theme of the Bible, and yet it's absent so, in so much of our Christian culture. There are all kinds of pagan fallacies that surround us that are embraced by the church. Evo the evolutionary myths. How many churches really take a stand on creation? Here is a, a concept that isn't just biological. It undergirds our laws, our field of psychology, all the rest, that is, that is disprovable, that has no evidence. What we should be pushing for is evidence-based education and not these myths that pervade our culture. And that, of course, inevitably leads to the denial of absolutes, relativism. And all through the scripture, that is uh, uh, held up as the ultimate error. The whole book of Judges uh, uh, characterizes a strange time when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That, was, that phrase repeats as an indictment of that period. And all through the scripture, we find the same thing. This whole idea of putting good for bad and bad for good is one of the ultimate uh, demonstrations of ignorance, and yet it's the foundation of our current culture. Now, the advantages of small groups is that, first of all, they multiply. We see that in, my, by, uh, in biology, we call it mitosis, but it's, it's disciplined multiplication. One of the great problems, there's all these conferences on church growth. The churches will grow if they are spirit-led, and they, God will take care of them. The last verse in, the, in Acts chapter 2, God, the, the Lord added daily to, to the church, such as should be saved. So the small groups are free of growth barriers. They're just in, in, intrinsically able to split and grow. And, and uh, what probably is one of the great attractions I discovered, talking to some of the young people, is that people are seeking involvement. They're not looking to uh, indulge in a, just a spectator sport. And uh, the, the ability to involve all the participants, obviously, is more natural in a small group. And as a result, you get personal transformation, and you also get accountability one to another, exactly what the New Testament espouses. It also turns out that small groups are more effective for new Christians, a place to ask questions, a place to, to get some candid answers to it that they'd never dream of bringing up in a, in a large assembly of some kind. It also solves the leadership crisis because small groups will breed new leaders as they split and grow. It also is more biblical, as we will uh, 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 explore as we go here. But one of the other dimensions of this, and I'm fascinated by this for two reasons, it's not only the historical roots of this movement, but it also may be prophetically relevant, and that is it's more of a persecution-proof structure. As I watch small groups growing in America, as I watch small groups 
uh, in, in, in the, the foreign countries that travel. Part of their dynamic is that they are, many of them, are in hostile environments. They're not in a place where there's a lot of Christian radio. They're not in a place where there are Christian bookstores where you can go down and pick up a copy of whatever. You know, we take that so for granted in this country. But even in the United States, people are moving aggressively into small groups to get answers uh, and grow and exchange and so forth. And by the way, they're also more efficient. They're lower cost. There's no overhead. You know, to, to support these large structures is overhead. As a, as a businessman, we all know what uh, fixed and variable costing is. Uh, the idea is that generally you, you win by getting the overhead down. Well, one way to get the overhead down is to have none. <laughs> and uh, they work. But let's take a look at a little bit of history here. Most of us have some perspective of the Roman Empire in those early years. Obviously, it was Caesar Augustus from 31 B.C. to 14 A.D. where Christ was born. We all recognize that from the biblical narrative. He was succeeded by Tiberius, that was Christ, the, 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 the emperor that, during which Christ was crucified. After that, we have some other interesting emperors. Caligula shows up from 37 to 41. And uh, there's an interesting incident in his career that's relevant to all of us, and that is that he tried to desecrate the temple. He, he left orders for his, his image to be placed in the Holy of Holies. And Petronius refused to do that, so Caligula ordered his death. But at, at sea, the messages got crossed, and that was never carried out because Caligula died a few weeks later. But it's interesting that the abomination of desolation was attempted but never done. It is yet a major milestone forthcoming as Jesus identified. And we have Claudius, and we finally get to Nero. He's very well known because it was in his reign that the persecutions really started in earnest. His burning of Rome was blamed on the Christians, and of course he, was, among other things, executed Paul. And we have a few other very short-lived emperors until we get to Vespasian, who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And that's probably one of the milestones, certainly a major milestone in Jewish history, but it's also important to understand in, in, in church history because uh, that, if nothing else, demonstrated the end of Mosaic Judaism because Mosaic Judaism was dependent on the idea that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Well, now there's no way to shed blood. There's no, there's no altar, there's no temple. So Judaism has to, re it, it takes them a couple of decades to redefine themselves into what we call Talmudic Judaism, but uh, very, very profound event when, the, when Jerusalem fell. And, of course, Titus and Domitian. Now, in, when Domitian comes on, um, that's when there were thousands of Christians slain. John's banished to Patmos under his reign. Trajan follows him. And uh, he was just trying to uphold the laws, but Christianity was regarded in those days as illegal. And that he also formalized uh, emperor worship issues. But with Christianity being illegal, that also gives you another coloration. It's easy to understand why during these decades there were no churches as we think of them. They met in the homes and they, they were basically underground. Hadrian follows. When we get to uh, 138 to 161, we have Antonius Pius. It was during this period we have the famous Bar Kokhba revolt. And what he, among other things, he levels Jerusalem. He decided he could never rule this unruly place as long as there were Jewish present. So they literally plowed Jerusalem under and built a Roman city on top of it called Aila Capitolina. And he was also the one that built the Temple to Jupiter in both uh, 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 where the Dome of the Rock sits today and also up in uh, Lebanon. At, uh, so, But for, at this point, we start to see the decline. Marcus Aurelius was the most severe since Nero. That was considered pretty much the peak of Roman power. He was the one that was uh, featured, if you will, in the famous, the recent movie, The Gladiator, as you recall. And he was indeed followed by Commodus, who was killed in the arena by a slave, by the way. I checked that out. I thought that was fascinating. But uh, we then have a whole series of emperors that were picked by the, the army in civil wars within the empire from the, at the, at the, uh, during the 2nd, 3rd century. And uh, I won't go through all of these. Some of them tolerate Christianity, and uh, some are uh, antagonistic. They're, they have their ups and downs. Um, and uh, some of them you know, persecute fur furiously. But um, we finally get down to Diocletian, 284 to 305. And he persecuted Christians furiously. And he attempted to abolish all Christians by torturing them to death. And of course, the catacombs of Rome have been much studied. There's hundreds of miles of them. And there's somewhere between 2 to 7 million graves, they estimate, down in the catacombs, much from this period. Along the way here now, there's a guy by the name of Nicholas who was one of the seven deacons at Acts uh, six, you may recall. Some authors believe that he was later influenced by Greek dualism and that he was the one that developed this idea of a professional clergy. And uh, 
the word Nicolaitan showed up, of course, in the book of Revelation. Nikao means to conquer or to be above others and laity of the common people. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus says he hates in any case, whether the Nicholas uh, view is correct or not, clearly they emerged. And that was a style within the Christian body of having professional clergy rule over the common people. And that's something that uh, Jesus said in his letters to the seven churches that he hated. He also demonstrated his concept of organization by washing their feet that night. If you want to understand organizations, Jesus, he that would be the, the greatest among you should be the servant of all. So he demonstrated himself by washing their feet to make that point. But we have this clergy, and we find that it, ro it rose as early as 100 A.D. Two letters to Clement of Rome refer to this, and Ignatius of uh, Antioch also uh, elevates a bishop to be the autocratic head of the local church. So we begin to see those kind of ideas creep in right after, in, in the first century after the church. Then we get into an era which I'll call Pergamy. We know what bigamy is, monogamy is. Pergamy is a perverted marriage. And we discover that the church gets, starts to get married to the world. A scholar by the name of Origen, he introduces a number of things. He's the one that promoted the idea of treating Scripture allegorically, but he also introduced the idea of infant baptism. The way they evangelized was to baptize the baby, and he was now saved and regenerated was the concept. Well, you get to the 312, when Constantine takes the throne of the known world, and he's faced with a couple of problems. He's got, I think, two or three different groups of sun worshippers in his realm. And he has these, this illegal group that's grown so large called Christians. And he ends up adopting Christianity and making it legal. So he, he, he sets out the Edict of Toleration in which he endorses Christianity as a legitimate religion. It is a second successor after him that makes it the state religion of the world. Um, but it's as part of all of this, house churches are outlawed. Now that the church is considered ordained by the state, that uh, the house churches are viewed as uh, deleterious to the state churches. So house churches are outlawed in 380. In 431, the Council of Ephesus uh, determines that Mary, uh, Mary worship, uh, Mary is to be worshipped as the mother of God. That starts that whole thing. And in 440, Leo the Great, is, he's the first one to use the term Bishop of Rome. And uh, Valentian confirmed as, confirmed as the spiritual leader of the Western Empire. So we're beginning to see the political power and the religious um, leadership coalesce in, in uh, this uh, as time goes on. It's about 500. We notice that there's common priestly dress code established. In 565, Justinian uh, actually regards the, state, the, the church as state uh, ordained. And at 607, Boniface III, he's the first one to use the term pope of the Catholic Church. And uh, it's about 709 that kissing his foot begins and all of that. So these are just some milestones. Uh, 786, we have the worship of images and relics develops in, in earnest. 850, the use of holy water begins. 995, we have the canonization of dead saints begin. 998, we have fasting on Fridays and before Lent's introduced. 1070, the celibacy of the priesthood is instituted. And that's a question of church property more than it is anything else, but let's not get into that here. 1090, we have the prayer beads adopted from paganism. 1184, the Inquisition begins, where Jews and witches and the like were um, executed if they didn't convert. And it's 1254 that Pope Innocent IV officially establishes the um, Inquisition. And the horrors of that era are starting. One pope one afternoon murdered more Christians than all the Roman emperors put together. 1190, we have the sale of indulgences, which will ultimately lead to, lead to Luther's Reformation, if you will. 1215, we find them ordaining the transubstantiation of water and wine, where they actually uh, teach that there's a miraculous uh, conversion of substance. And uh, that has now gone to the point where they literally bow down and worship the wafers. It's astonishing when you, if you investigate the worship of the Eucharist in current practices. 1229, the reading of the Bible was forbidden to laymen. We begin to see that tide again reemerging. And uh, 1414, we have a communion cup forbidden to lay people. 1439, the doctor of purgatory was decreed. And 1492, the Jews were outlawed in Spain. And at midnight on the deadline is when Columbus sailed, by the way. There's another indication that he and his crew were Jewish, but let's move on. 1545 was when tradition, church tradition, was, was deemed as equal authority with the Bible. And that's probably the root division between the Protestant and the Catholic Church is the question of authorities. But that, of course, leads to the Reformation. We get to 1517 and Luther's 95 Thesis. He wasn't the only one, but that's 
a major milestone that's usually pointed to. And we have a whole list of others, Zwingli, Melanchthon, and uh, Calvin, and John Knox, and others uh, in various regions are going back to the Bible, and that led to the Reformation. Now, it's interesting, something that most of us as Protestants don't realize, unless we've done some homework, in 1526, there was a reversion by Luther and others to the traditional forms of services. And part of the example here was the Anabaptists. There were a number that from the Bible concluded that this idea of infant uh, baptism was not biblical. They wanted to be baptized in the sense of, uh, uh, as a response to commitment to Christ. And so they were called sec- uh, baptizing again. They were called Anabaptists. And they were, not, they were persecuted. Uh, and they, not only were they persecuted, but it caused the formal Protestant churches to revert back to even more formalism of liturgies and so forth. It had, it had, had uh, an adverse effect on the style of worship. And uh, in 1530, Luther himself is quoted saying that all lay pastors teaching publicly are to be killed even if they're correct. Very, very, there's a shocking side of, of, of uh, Luther that you don't generally run into unless you do some research. And Schweckenfeld was a friend of his and, and uh, tried to provide some corrections and he got outlawed, his disciples were jailed. It, it, it's a, it was a very tense situation. But in any case, and, and, and by the way, one of the things uh, I'm indebted to Dave Hunt, he not only, is, his book, A Woman Rides the Beast, is an excellent, well-documented history of the medieval church that it will shock you if you haven't gone through it. But what, in his more recent, in the research for his more recent book, he discovered things about the Protestant side that's not much better, that they murdered and tortured people who didn't agree with them almost with the zeal and, and, and uh, energy of, of the Baptists and the Jesuits and the rest of it. So uh, it's a very, very gloomy period of history on both sides of the aisle, so to speak. But by 1600, the good news is there were f- over 40 translations from the Latin Bible into various languages throughout uh, the region, and people were able to get a copy of the Bible in for themselves. We have the Huguenots and uh, all of that by the, before the 1700s. So persecutions continue. In the fourth century, of course, the church was canonized by the state. And from that point on, we discover that independent fellowships are outlawed and persecuted, not just by the Catholic Church, of course, but by the the powerful Protestants as as they gain power also. The Reformation did an incredible job in the field of soteriology, that is, this whole issue of salvation. Salvation by faith alone. That was the watch cry of the uh, Reformation. And indeed, it's part of what freed um, the church to discover the liberty to have in Christ. But the tragedy of the Reformation, among other things, is they didn't go any, they didn't go further. And they didn't re-examine all kinds of other erroneous traditions. They didn't re-examine their hermeneutics. They didn't re-examine their eschatology. And they carried forward in uh, many of these uh, pagan and non-biblical concepts that characterized the medieval church, you'll find in, in still vestiges of them still in the mainline Protestant denominations. Now, it's interesting that Protestant leadership to this day, in many places, continues to persecute deviant groups which adhere to biblical doctrines. So we need to understand that this is, admittedly, we don't have stakes being put up in the village square and people burned at them, but we do have some pretty bitter uh, reactions around. In uh, the Anabaptists, from 1535 to 1546, over 30,000 of the Anabaptists were killed. These were people that were trying to do what they thought was scriptural. And there's a bunch of other brotherhoods. In fact, we could go through a whole list of these you probably haven't heard of because they're not promoted, obviously, by anybody unless you're doing some research. But you'll discover all through history there are independent groups meeting in houses that typically are pre-trib, pre-millennial in their viewpoints, but most, in any case, what they do have in common is an adherence to the Scripture above all things, and they are attacked and abused by whom? Not just by the state, but by the empowered churches at the time. And as you go into foreign countries, even to this day, sometimes your most uh, vigorous opposition comes from the established church in the region. Let's take a look at Wesley revival. You know, when you talk about revivals in Britain, so you always talk about the Wesleys. You know, what you need to realize is that's a small group situation. Uh, it was very well directed, and it was focused not on evangelism, but on discipleship. The first thing you could get into is what they called a trial band. And uh, each one of these is linked to what, one of their views of grace what they call prevenient grace. That's the grace before you believe, God reaching. And, and if you were in a trial band, the idea there was to make it difficult to stay and easy to get out of. Just the opposite of what we think of evangelism. If you miss three meetings in a quarter, you're out. Um, 
but basically these are for provisional seekers. If you survive that, usually two or three months, uh, then you'll, uh, about four to six people would meet together with a leader every week for about two or three months. And if you still hung in there and, and were, a ser- if you were seriously seeking Jesus Christ, you were then allowed to be a member of the United Societies, they call themselves. And you're also entitled to go to a class meeting. And they, what they called this area was convincing grace. And, uh, to, and uh, this is your meeting here with 12 to 36 people. And you did this for about two years probably until they felt you were really born again or had a spirit-filled experience, what have you. And that entitled you to go what they called a man band meeting. That was the converting grace. The class meeting was focused on the mind. The man meeting was on the will. And this is a commitment to discipleship. Four to eight people. In this case, they separated men and women. And they separated married and unmarried. But they were all presumably born again. That was the, the, the context for the meeting. And if you really, after you, in that a while, when you were really considered spiritually mature, you would enter what they called the select band, and uh, that was the spirit filled from Romans 5 5 and Galatians 3 28. You were mature. And there you were co mixed again because there's no Jew or Gentile. You know, they, 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 were, they were, it was not a segregated kind of meeting. But the point is, they had these different small groups, and in their case, they had it very well organized. But what was the result? Well, in 1768, after 30 years, they had 40 circuits, as they were called. They had 27,341 members. By 1800, one of every 30 Englishmen was a member of the United Society and involved in these small groups. So with whatever, their, when, when, when uh, Charles and John die, the thing starts to get formalized. They get away from the small groups. They, form, they, 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 they gravitate to the, the traditional, what we think of the traditional church format. But the magic days were days when two things were happening. They had a focus on discipleship rather than evangelism, and they did it through small groups and uh, had the fam- famed Wesley revival. And uh, so there is another form of this that I ran into in San Diego, and it, I, I'm sure it's not unique. There may be others like this across the country, but they're very distinctive in many ways. They, they call themselves the Rock Church, and uh, everyone in Sunday Church is also in a member of a small group of 6 to 12. And during that, during the week, these small groups meet with their facilitators. Not a teacher, he's just a facilitator for discussions. He's trained to be a facilitator. And uh, they pray, they hold themselves accountable, and they discuss the sermon notes from Sunday's sermon, which are, are, are distributed and so forth. And uh, when the small group grows to 12 or more, it is forced to split. It is because it's run by some very uh, nationally known athletes, that were coaches and things, they have a, they have a tremendous... Um, Comfort with the young people, There's a, they, they really work well together. But it's also very, very structured, very, very organized. But the young people seem to enjoy that because they all feel a sense of participation. You can't be passive, you've you got to be involved. And so in the first two years, the Rock Church has grown to, from a start to over 4,000, and it's growing so that they have all kinds of growth pains, having a good time. The Congregational Church, that we think of in classic terms, is, is we think, sometimes we use the term, it's a building call it a cathedral or a church, what have you. It involves a special day, typically Sunday, for various reasons. And it is, has a professional leadership. Call it a priest, a clergyman, a pastor, what have you. And there's a special service performed for the people. Ceremonies, interpretations, motivation. This is a pattern, by the way, borrowed from the synagogue in many respects. And when, when the church gets formalized and made part of the state in the 4th century, they borrow pretty much the format from the, what, what had emerged in the synagogue pattern. You know, it takes these five things. The fifth thing is a way to maintain itself. Call those tithes and offerings. This is one organized. This is this is what seems to distinguish. If you try to put all the different forms together, they all have these characteristics from from uh, the fourth century to the, through today. But there's a life cycle to churches, and some of the critics have highlighted an interesting pattern that I'll just share with you for what it's worth. You usually start with a people-oriented pastor. And as he grows and as he prospers and does well, he becomes a pulpit-oriented pastor as he gets a drawing. And as that continues, there's a tendency for him then to become property-oriented, where we start talking about buildings and lands and other assets. And, you know, the example to this in the scripture that's disturbing is to take a good look at Gideon. His famous victory in in, uh, Judges 7, of course, is well known. But the following chapters about Gideon is really chapters in which he snatches defeat from the jaws of victory, so to speak. Because he's so popular from his victory that they want him to rule over them. And he doesn't want to do that, but I will take your gold. So he allows them to, to give him gold. And he builds up an estate. And it's interesting, he has 70 sons. 
But he also has a son from a concubine, Abimelech. And Abimelech, to go after that estate, murders all the 70 sons. After you, and, and, and you see this whole dismal aftermath because of his shift from what he was called to do into property, if you will. Interesting thing. And that, for you get to a power-oriented pastorate, and, and that's where you start getting into the return of what we call the Nicolaitans, and uh, that leads to politically driven decay. It's tragic to see so many groups that at one time were vibrant and, and fruitful for the, for the Lord's business become shells that are just social clubs that, are, um, that manifest their spiritual bankruptcy by the kinds of things they tolerate within their top councils. Question of accountability. The other thing you find, another thing that causes me great concern is management by hearsay. And uh, we, could de- we could spend a, the whole hour on this whole business of their failure to apply Matthew 18. These large organizations tend to manage by hearsay. This leads to a concept that I might mention. In decision theory and also in organizations, there's a concept they call the objective function. That is something objective, not subject, that the organization is trying to achieve. If there is a manifest objective function, an empirically definable goal, the organizations tend to be very free of politics. If you are in a military infantry in combat, it sort of takes care of itself. If you are on a sales team that's well managed in, in, for, a, uh, for sales goals, everyone in the team can tell how they're doing. They can all tell whether we're winning or losing. Even though it may be a team deal, not a hero thing, they still, as a group, can tell when they're winning or losing. And that's called the objective function. There's a way to tell. So there's certain kinds of organizations, you'll notice, that are relatively free of politics in the, in the, in the negative sense. But there are certain kinds of organizations, and I'll mention schools, hospitals, and churches, which lack a clear objective function. Can you tell whether you're winning? By the time the students graduate, it's a long time before you can tell, really measure what, what your product is really like. But even by the indirect measures, we can tell pretty much that our educational establishment is pretty dismal. That's, um, uh, same thing's true, uh, surprisingly enough, in hospitals, because there isn't a direct linkage between the winning and losing. But th- what we're talking about here is churches. How do you measure the effectiveness of the church by the membership, that's a mistake. How do you do that? Because, it, 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 see, we have a tendency to substitute evangelism for discipleship. And um, it's interesting that scholars will tell you that you search in vain to find in the New Testament a call to evangelism as we use the term. What you do find all through the Gospels and the, to, is, is a call to discipleship, to make disciples. And uh, so that's, a, that's part of the problem here. Now, it's getting back to these small groups. I learned something interesting. You know, we, we tend to think of home fellowships um, in, a, in a certain characteristic way here in the States. Uh, in Korea and apparently in China, they have a very different view. Um, a friend of mine was visiting and he was treated, apparently unusual privilege, to attend with his host a home fellowship. And he said he'd love to. So they get in his Mercedes, happened to be a doctor, well-placed, and they drove almost an hour to get to where this meeting's taking place. They arrive, and there's 20 or 30 people that are meeting weekly, but it's a closed club. They're all doctors. In other words, they organize their fellowships, not by geography, like the neighborhood, but by people with a common interest. It also is one that they don't normally bring strangers to, because it's an intimate, private meeting. When they decide that there's somebody they'd like to invite to join them, they usually pray about it six months before they decide, and then after they do that, they pray for about six months on who's going to be the one to approach them. It's almost, uh, the, it has almost the color of a private secret society, and that's not the point. It's that they regard it as intimate. Their mission is not evangelism, as we would think of it. See, we all jump to the conclusion, boy, we'll have a home Bible study, and we, we outreach to the community. Well, that's a legitimate, they, that can be legitimate, but not, that's not necessarily the only um, opportunity. The other opportunity that's more missing and more fruitful and more essential is making disciples, edifying the body, meeting together for your mutual edification, mutual accountability, mutual growth. And uh, a stranger sometimes can be deleterious to that goal. In Korea, anyway, they're organized by profession sometimes and by special invitation only to even get in. It's more of a closed club idea. In any case, what we're experiencing, I believe, as we look around the world and look at what's really going on in the United States an explosion towards the past. I'll call it 
a, a spiritual version of Back to the Future. And it, to me, it was a, it, it's a interesting, it led to an interesting personal discovery because as I look back at my personal growth, and as I look back at the experiences I've had over five decades, I, I think I can say with very little qualification uh, or footnotes that the real growth I've seen in people uh, has been in the home, in the home environment. And uh, I think this is a modern trend of hope. As we look at America and we realize how desperately this country needs a revival, as we see judges being removed because they want the Ten Commandments manifested as the foundation of our laws. That's just history. That's not, um, As we look at the uh, um, departure from our heritage by the so-called liberals. I, I, have to, I have to add this other comment, I think. Because I really, I've gotten some feedback on this issue too. I, I, ha, I think we have a vocabulary problem, and um, you know the homosexual community has passed off this concept that we're gay, gay pride, and all that business. Um, nothing gay about that lifestyle at all. It's 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 life shortening. It's it's disgusting, uh, in many ways, um, if you really understand what's involved. So, uh, it's certainly uh, ungodly. But they pass this off as vocabulary into the press. You know, we have a pr- vocabulary problem. We keep calling these people that are adversaries to what we're interested in, liberals. And that's a misnomer. Liberals are broad-minded. Being liberal in general is a good thing. And these people we're talking about are not liberal at all. They, they are totally intolerant unless you agree with them. And they are, uh, they're, what their goal, their avowed goal is to separate us from our heritage. Whether it's the family, whether it's our national roots, um, whether it's our, our common commitment uh, an expression in our Constitution, in our Declaration of Independence, of the Creator God. So they're not liberals, they're subversives. That's the only word I can come up with. But in any case, as we survey our country and realize that it is heading for judgment, uh, Robert Bork, in his book, Slouching Towards Gomorrah, pointed out very, very thoroughly, eloquently, that unless the, the, America's over unless there's a grassroots revival. And that's the, that's the conclusion from a very, you know, from Robert Bork and, uh, and many others that have written similar kinds of summaries. Um, it all, it all even goes back to Thomas Jefferson, who says, I tremble when I recall that our God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. One of the most often asked questions I get as I travel across the country is God going to judge America? And as you go, survey America through the lens of the Bible, you realize we're long overdue for judgment. And uh, the only thing that will save us is if we, if we can have a revival. And God may be providing us such a revival, we just don't see it. Because I do see all across America, people spontaneously meeting in homes to get into the Word of God. Some of these are sponsored by the local church, praise God for that. Some of them are just independent. Some of them tragically are even being done in a, in a us and them uh, rebellious mood, and that's unfortunate. But it is happening, and people are getting back to the Word of God. And uh, it's interesting that the persecuted church was a home church. And I think the persecutions may be yet on the horizon. And it may be God's way of preparing the body for some dark times ahead. All of this, I believe, has a profound impact on each of us. It certainly has on me, and I believe it it will have on you. You have an opportunity before you that is probably the most profound opportunity that we can imagine. We've done it. We, we've published, I guess, over a hundred various publications. But the one that you're watching right now may prove in your life to be one of the most important discoveries of all the things we've ever talked about. And we'll talk a little bit more in the next session about what you can do about it. For a complete listing of materials to further enhance your personal Bible study, or to receive a free one-year subscription to Chuck Missler's monthly Christian Intelligence News Journal personal update, contact Quinonia House at 1-800-K-HOUSE-1. That's 1-800-K-H-O-U-S-E-1. Or you can write to Quinonia House at P.O. Box D, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, 83816-0347. To fax your correspondence, dial 208-773-6312. 